Good evening, everybody. I'm Simon Sporter, and welcome to this evening's Q&A with Oli Skadjul, LTA Participation Director at the LTA, who is going to present the 24 to 26 LTA updated plan. So welcome, Oli. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thanks, Simon. So the format of the evening is that Oli is going to present uh, where the LTA has got to thus far with its initial five-year plan, and then talk about the updated plan and where the LTA is heading. To follow that, you will all have the opportunity to ask questions of Oli. And to follow that, Oli has requested that he stay in the background because he's very interested to hear conversation between all of you as well. We will just open a conversation where all participants will just have an opportunity to uh, digest and discuss what's happened during the session, talk about the plan and what they have taken in about the plan. Some of you may have heard about it already. Some of you will all be very new to you and you'll all have the opportunity. So we're going to be in no hurry and a good opportunity for us all to really see what the plan is all about and how it is going to impact us as volunteers and in general clubs. So Ollie, if you want to start now with your presentation, that would be great. Thanks very much, uh, Simon, and um, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen, so bear with me whilst I do that. Um, Simon, can you see that now? Yes, I can. All good. Thank you. Great. Um, so, look, thanks again for the opportunity, Simon. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, as Simon has just uh, mentioned, the purpose of I suppose the next 25 minutes or so is to review the progress we've made in British tennis over the last five years. So between 2019 and 2023. And as a result of that overview, what our evolved plan looks like for the next three years from 24 to 26. It's important. And I'll probably come back to this point, but it is very much an evolved plan because what we've done over the last five years with the support of all of you um, is made some really good progress in the sport. And we very much want to continue um, to build on that progress that we've seen over the last five years. And hence, this is an evolution rather than a revolution of what we've been doing. Uh, however, I think it's probably worth me taking us back to 2018 um, when we went about understanding what we should be focusing on uh, as the LTA and in British tennis. And what the situation was back then with the sport. So just a few, I suppose, points to bring that to life. So back in 2018, participation in tennis had been on a 10 year decline. We um, hadn't seen the success that we would have wanted to see at the performance end of the sport. And in fact, when Andy Murray won Wimbledon, in 2013, he was the only British man in the top 200 in the world at that point in time uh, in the men's singles rankings. Also, tennis was seen um, by many as a traditional uh, and elitist sport and possibly difficult to, to access uh, at times and certainly maybe difficult to play. And when we conducted what was a pretty comprehensive listening and consultation exercise with the sport. So including people who currently played the sport, people who had played but had lapsed from the sport, people who didn't play tennis, as well as obviously volunteers and coaches and officials and county associations. Um, it was um, really interesting to, to kind of understand what was fed back to us. Um, amongst, amongst those points that I've already referenced, there was definitely a view that although there were lots of well-meaning people in the sport, uh, that the sport was quite fragmented. We weren't all pulling in the same direction. So as a result of that consultation exercise and that listening exercise and understanding where the sport was, we set about trying to develop uh, a strategy headed by a, a vision and a mission that everyone will, uh, that everyone will, could sign up to. Um, we, we thought it was important to have a a unifying vision that although people might have had a different view as to how you might best get there, that no one could disagree with the sentiment of, of what we were trying to, to achieve. And obviously also to try and ensure that, that our strategy um, kind of 
uh, drew on all the amazing benefits that we know tennis can achieve more widely. You know, the fact that it's ageless, you can play it from eight to 83. It's very sociable. It's great for physical as well as mental health and well-being. So we really wanted to try and ensure that our plan capitalized uh, on those um, really important benefits uh, and features of the sport that people were, were telling us about when we did the consultation exercise. So um, what did that lead to? Well, it, it, it led to the development of a, of a vision of tennis opened up uh, and a mission to grow tennis by making it relevant, accessible, welcoming and enjoyable. The vision of tennis opened up, as I said, hopefully has been a way in which we've been able to galvanize the sport behind a common purpose. Uh, I don't think anyone can really argue with the fact that there's lots of benefits in opening the sport up to more and different people. And at that point in time, as I mentioned, the sport had been in decline. So it was really important that we set out to try and grow the sport. And those four words of relevant, accessible, welcoming and enjoyable were deliberately selected based on the feedback that we received through the consultation exercise that I briefly described a few minutes ago. Of course, to, to complement that vision and that mission, we set out a, a number of what we called strategic pillars. So seven key strategic pillars, again, um, designed to um, address uh, the key areas of focus that we felt we needed to um, zero in on. And, and again, based on the feedback that we had received. I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but you can see them on the screen there from visibility on the left hand side through to leadership uh, on the right hand side at the bottom. Um, each of them playing a really important role in how we set out to carry out our work over the over the last five year period. And as you would imagine, underneath each of these seven strategic pillars were a set of what we call tactics, um, if you like, key areas of work that we felt were important to identify and deliver against in order to achieve the outcome of that strategy, in order then to deliver against the mission of growing the sport and the vision of, of opening tennis up. So if that's a very brief summary of how we set out to carry out our work back in 2019, um, where are we now, uh, five years on? So this slide um, is, is an important one to talk to. Um, as part of that strategy for the last five years, we identified some very um, hard, hard numerically based um, objectives, uh, which you can see on the screen. Um, and actually, uh, one of the key one of the key questions, one of the uh, common questions, our, our CEO was asked um, when he came into the job um, uh, in early 2018 was, "Are you going to focus on participation, or are you going to focus on performance?" Because uh, I think historically the LTA had flip flopped between the two. Um, and Scott was very keen, our CEO was very keen to actually think about it in a slightly different way. And in fact, it's not about focusing on one or the other, it's about focusing equally on both. And actually also looking at fans, um, you know, trying to get as many people as possible at the top of the funnel interested and engaged in the sport, um, such that you can talk to them, communicate with them, hopefully in an increasingly personalized way in order to drive them to participate in the sport, pick up a racket, pick up a ball and play tennis. And obviously, we know that if you do that successfully and you have a concentrated player base, you're more likely to have a volume of people coming through at the performance end of the sport. And obviously, performance at the top end of the sport in major tournaments and grand slams um, obviously inspires more people to follow tennis. And therefore, you create this virtuous circle. And the, the objectives outlined on the screen were the, were the ones that we set um, about trying to achieve. So increasing the number of fans in our database, growing participation uh, amongst adults, both yearly and monthly, growing children's participation and um, trying to get more players in the top 100. Uh, and also we set ourselves some medal targets around the Paralympics. So in, in summary, um, what, what have we achieved? So from a fan perspective, um, we actually started with about 
580,000 people on our database, fans on our database. And today we have some 1.5 million, which is some quite significant growth. And it does enable us to engage with uh, that audience, as I said, in an ever increasing personalized way, um, serving them up information um, about what they're interested in, because we know more about them, and ultimately helping them to uh, or encouraging them to get on court and to play tennis. And we know from the data that we've got that that approach has um, really supported and motivated um, more people in the last year, particularly to pick up a racket and get down to their local tennis court and play. There's obviously other benefits of having a, a broad fan base and being able to communicate to a large volume of people, particularly when it comes to our ability to um, promote uh, major events and, and, and sell tickets to them as well. So that has been another key, key benefit of, of growing, growing our fan base. When it comes to participation, I imagine this is particularly of interest to, to people on the call. Um, hopefully this graph isn't too confusing, but what it shows is um, a range of frequencies of adult participation. Um, so the top blue line um, is uh, a, a trend line that shows the, the number of adults age 16 plus playing tennis at least once a year. And as you can see, we, we started off in 2019 at some 3.9 million people, um, and we've grown that to some 5.6 million people over that five-year period, which is about 11% uh, of the population uh, of Great Britain. The green line shows the number of adults who uh, are playing tennis monthly, so on a more frequent basis. And again, that's grown from 1.3 to, to 2.6 million people, which again is a significant um, achievement. And the other two lines just represent twice monthly and weekly play. We've also grown the number of kids uh, playing tennis. Um, so we actually have now about 700,000 children who pick up a racket and play tennis at least once a week, um, which is actually some 40% of the um, uh, population of children who actually play tennis on a yearly basis. So. If, um, if it's 700,000 kids who pick up a racket and play tennis at least once a week, we have some 3.6 million people, kids who pick up a racket and play tennis yearly. Um, and that is 40% of the population of children in Britain. So that's really quite significant that 40% of children in Great Britain are experiencing tennis of some form at least once a year. And then we're managing to convert 700,000 of those kids to play tennis weekly, which is a really significant achievement. And, and what I would call out here is just a couple of things that, you know, again, I'm very cognizant that probably most of the audience here tonight come from a, a club background. And what we've seen um, is we've seen growth in the terms of the number of people playing within the club environment. So we've gone from something like 800,000 people playing in clubs yearly to some 1.3 million. So a growth of over half a million people playing tennis in clubs. Um, which has been a, a really positive um, sign of the plan, and obviously, um, you know, is in a huge part down to the down to the volunteer network that we have working in in those facilities. And I would also say that most of the growth that we've seen in children's participation would have also come from the club sector. And just finally, on this slide, out of interest, you know, we we obviously track participation amongst other sports and physical activities, and. You know, tennis is um, up there in terms of um, the most highest participated in sports that we have in Britain. So as you would imagine, football um, is is kind of at the top, uh, but actually golf and tennis are pretty close, neck and neck in, in kind of second and third place, um, respectively, um, quite some way ahead of uh, the likes of cricket and, and, and rugby. From a performance perspective, I'm not going to dwell too much on this slide, but there's been a number of successes um, and particularly in respect of the strength and depth of the player base now. So um, in 2023, so last year, we had nine different British players uh, in the top 100 ATP and WTA rankings, um, which again is a significant um, achievement. We um, achieved four medals at the 2020 Paralympic Games and we've um, achieved six wheelchair Grand Slam titles uh, last year in 2023. So from a performance perspective, although there's lots more work to be done, 
um, the strength and depth is is starting to kind of come through, which again is is a really positive sign. This slide was just meant to, I suppose, identify and indicate the the areas that we've looked to, uh, I suppose, um, identify and work through over the last five years. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, um, and I've highlighted there in orange the ones that I think might be of most relevance to to this audience. I suppose just to highlight maybe three particularly um, from the ones in orange. So from a venue and club support perspective, um, it's something we, we've had a huge focus on, how we better support clubs to grow and retain their membership, increase participation and be financially sustainable. I've mentioned the increase in the number of people playing at tennis clubs from 800,000 to 1.3 million. But also we've seen an increase in club health, which we've measured consistently over the last five year period. And indeed in volunteer engagement, which we've also measured consistently uh, over the last five year, uh, five year period. That's not to say there isn't a lot more work to be done. Of course there is, there always is. But um, there has been some really significant progress in um, our support of, of, of clubs and venues um, and in how um, clubs and venues have become um, more resilient um, in, 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 in the work that they do and actually also um, gained more members and, and more participants. From a facilities investment perspective, um, I just wanted to kind of reference that over the last five years, there's been about a £30 million investment into club facilities uh, across Britain. Um, some £10 million of that coming from the LTA, with about £20 million in, in third party funding um, um, to, to kind of make up that, that overall pot. And that's, that's gone into, you know, lots of different schemes, including schemes that have put in floodlights, that have put in new or upgraded courts, um, more indoor courts, and obviously more recently paddle courts as well. So although there's probably more recently been quite a lot of focus on our parks investment program, actually, um, on a comparative basis, about a similar amount of money over the last five years has been invested into club facilities. And finally on here, I was going to reference safeguarding. Um, you know, a, a, a really important area um, for our sport and indeed for any sport, um, whether it's been the venue standards that we've implemented, the coach standards, the um, venue support visits we now have in place. <clears throat> um, there's been a huge amount of work from lots of people, including all of you. And what I would say is that um, five, six years ago, we had a lot of work to do um, in this area. But now we are regarded as probably the leading sport in safeguarding. And for the last seven years, we've received the highest score from the Child Protection in Sport Unit um, in their annual inspection of the LTA. And, and that achievement wouldn't, wouldn't have happened without the work and diligence of, of, all, of all of you and the many um, other thousands of volunteers there are working in tennis up and down the country. Um, what I thought I'd do now, because I've spoken for quite a long time already, is just play a short video, um, hopefully the sound's okay, that just hopefully encapsulates some of what I've just talked about and the progress that we've seen in British tennis over the last few years. Action. <laughs> wins a marathon in Manchester. Moving on to Malaga. We're the Tennisables, and we're here to help you crush it at tennis. It's never been easier to level up. Everyone deserves the equal chances in life, whether you're rich, you're poor, you're gay, you're straight. The LTA this year with Pride Days for the whole month is a fantastic initiative. LTA Advantage is here and it's your one-stop shop for everything you need to play, compete and follow tennis.
You've got two young black British men here playing on a British show court. How important is that? I think it's so important. I mean, further me and Paul go, hopefully there's a lot more kids like us that pick up a racket and try to play. Great for them to, to be out the classroom, being active. Hopefully I can help inspire them, put some more rackets in their hands. Oh, it's actually decent. I'm very sentimental about this place. It's one of the areas that my little babies grew up. Looking at the courts now, this is amazing. Being disabled, it's not always, you know, fun and games. But when you come to a place like this and you have people who are like you and they understand what you go through, it's really nice and it's really special. At the end of the day, tennis can be for everyone. Tennis can be adapted to these guys' needs and it can be used for enjoyment and all different kinds of things. So, no, it's, it's inspiring. The LTA Tennis Foundation partners with amazing people and organisations to help improve lives through tennis. There is a lot of talk about if we had, you know, the next next players coming up from a lot of the press and uh, I feel like we've really shown this week there's a lot of depth in British tennis and I hope we keep looking at that and thinking of the positives. is the Wimbledon champion. Great Britain have done the unthinkable. The world's number one pair are Wimbledon champions. Delphi Hewitt, the world number one. Um, so, as I said, just, just a kind of short video to try and encapsulate some of the successes over the last five years. And I don't know about you, but I never get tired of seeing that last uh, clip of, of obviously Emma winning winning the US Open, which was um, such an amazing performance. So um, where next? Um, as I said at the start, it's very much about continuing the journey, about evolution rather than revolution. But of course, we have undertaken an exercise to try and understand um, what's worked in the last five years, where, where we've seen um, growth, what's been driving that. Um, we've you know, undertaken an exercise to kind of look at some of the macro societal trends that we need to be cognizant of as a sport. We've obviously looked at what other sports and activities are doing. Um, and really importantly, we've looked at all the great data and insight that we have at our disposal, whether that's um, things that I've already mentioned, like our club health survey and understanding what clubs are feeling about, about their health and about the sport, uh, our volunteer engagement surveys and, and what um, the huge network of, of, of volunteers across Britain are, are, are doing and feeling and saying um, needs to be done. Uh, coaches, officials, you name it. We, we've made sure that we've kind of looked at all aspects of, of, of the sport uh, to try and understand what we need to do next. And of course, you know, we've obviously developed this plan in conjunction with seeking input from uh, the LTA Council, from colleagues, from obviously our board, who ultimately signed off this plan at the end of at the end of last year. Uh, and as I just referenced a couple of minutes ago, we, we were very keen to understand what has driven the growth in participation that I spoke about some 10 minutes or so ago. And I'm not going to go through all of these five areas, but we have been able to unpick and understand better some of the areas that have contributed more significantly to the growth that we've seen in the sport and I'm just going to point you all towards number four down there and that is um, you know maybe the fairly obvious point but you know all the great work that you're doing to make your venues and your clubs healthier in respect of membership growth and membership retention and financial um, health and good governance obviously goes towards creating healthier, more vibrant tennis venues, which um, unsurprisingly uh, attract and retain more players. And that is something certainly that um, we've seen as, as a key driver of the growth that, that I've, um, I, I've already articulated, um, which again is really positive. So that's something that we want to continue to, to kind of focus on over the, over the next three years. So it's very much consistency of vision um, with a slightly evolved mission. So tennis opened up remains. I, again, I, I've already referenced that 
historically the LTA have been accused of fit flopping from one strategy to the next uh, historically and we very much don't want to do that we think things are working the evidence would suggest that things are working we know there's a lot more work to do we know there's areas to improve further but tennis open up remains a slight tweak to our to our mission um which instead of growing tennis um because we've already done that we want to continue to do that but we also want to help transform local communities through tennis particularly by making our sport welcoming enjoyable and inspiring for anyone who wants to get involved we've um identified six um strategic uh, pillars so we've narrowed it in slightly from seven to six there's a lot of consistency um, in respect of, um, of those um, strategic pillars in front of you. Um, I think four remain the same. Um, we've identified grow as a, as a kind of like evolution um, of one of our pre-existing strategic pillars and kind of goes to the point that it's really important that we continue to look to grow our fan base, continue to look to grow our player base across all formats, across all programs, and particularly also within competition. Um, I mentioned competition because given we've seen growth in the sport, one of the things we need to be cognizant of going forward is how we retain those players in the sport. And we think competition, appropriate competition at all levels um, can be a really powerful retention tool. And the other, the other new, if you like, strategic pillar here is diversify. So really with, with two aspects of diversify in mind, one is how we diversify opportunities to play the sport, be that paddle, be that pickleball, be that other formats, and also how we diversify our, our, our revenue streams to support the long-term financial health um, of tennis. Um, this is a very, very busy slide, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but I wanted to give you some sense as to some of the detail that sits beneath those six strategies. The ones in yellow, the ones that um, I highlighted that I thought might be the most relevant for, for this audience tonight. Um, I'm just going to pick up uh, on a couple of them. So number one in the top left hand side uh, of the screen, very much want to continue to focus on our facilities investment, um, particularly in respect of parks and covered courts and CITCs and paddle. So again, that's obviously relevant to, to clubs in respect of our investment into looking at how we cover more courts at more venues up and down the country. We know that um, we, we've got a lack of, of kind of indoor or covered court provision in Britain. So that, that's a key area of focus for us. Um, number three, um, I think all of you as volunteers um, to a certain extent might be reliant on some of the digital and technology products and services we have in place. We know that they haven't always been the most reliable and resilient um, that we or, or show the most resilience that we would like. Um, we feel we're in a much better place now, having gone through quite a significant transformation of our of our digital and technology infrastructure. But absolutely, it's an area that we need to continue to focus on because we need to make sure that all the experiences of everyone um, working and playing our sport, following our sport is as good as it can be, whether that's finding and booking and entering a competition or whether it's finding a local court to play on and someone to play with. So that's another one that, that I would that I would call out. Um, number six, continuing to embed and grow our LTA youth program, trying to get more young children playing and staying in tennis and working through our venues and our clubs, as well as through coaches and volunteers to try and achieve that. Number nine, about diversifying our player base. Really important that we continue to look to um, open up the sport to more and different people. One very pleasing thing is that We've actually seen a higher participation growth in the last sort of 12 to 18 months amongst a lower socioeconomic group than we have an ABC One audience. So continuing to focus on that is important. Obviously, those with a disability and women and girls, one of the strengths of our sports is it is gender balanced on the whole, but there is still a difference in terms of the rates of participation amongst men and women, and we want to try and uh, address that. Uh, number 13 there is obviously very relevant to this audience, how we continue to develop and enhance our support and engagement with all those entities mentioned there, but including our member organisations and particularly our venues and our tennis clubs and facilities. And then over on the right hand side of the screen, 
you know, continue to, you know, ensure that we support all aspects of the sport in maintaining, developing the highest safeguarding standards as well as anti-doping and integrity standards. And number 24 there about how we look to continue to support in driving down good governance standards and practices uh, across the sport. Um, so look, those are a few things that I wanted to highlight that I thought were, you know, relevant for, for this audience here um, tonight. And finally, before I close, um, just in terms of some next steps, um, obviously I'm speaking to you all tonight. Throughout the remainder of, of, of quarter one, we'll be looking to communicate and speak to various people in the sport um, uh, and to, to kind of communicate what our plans are, uh, as well as identify what some of our priorities are for the first year of this new three-year plan, so, so 2024. Um, and there will be a number of materials that, that we can send around either via Simon or, or directly kind of after this. So whether it's this infographic that kind of, you know, pictorially hopefully demonstrates the progress we've made over the last five years and what's coming next, but as well as a, an actual um, plan document as well, which sits on the LTA website that we can that we can share with all of you. So, Simon, that that's it from me. I'm going to stop sharing now so I can actually start to see some faces again. Um, but Hopefully that was clear and you managed to follow all of that. Lovely. Thank you very much, Ollie. Very good presentation. I very much enjoyed it. I've seen some of it before, but very focused on, as you put it, our audience tonight and the tennis volunteer community. So thank you. Now, before we go straight off to the floor, uh, just what I'd ask you to do is put your electronic hands up if you've got questions for Ollie. If we can try and stay on topic of tonight, which is the plan. I'm sure you may have other questions for Ollie, but there'll be other occasions for those questions. And if you can ask your questions as briefly as possible, then giving Ollie an opportunity to answer them, and that will give more people an opportunity to speak. So would anyone like to go first tonight? And if you can just say where you're from as well, when you uh, start speaking, that'd be great as well. Any electronic hands coming up? I'm just having a look. Nobody just ah, Peter Peter Tulaney, please come in. Hello, good evening, Peter Tulaney from uh, Walton, Milton Keynes. Um, just a question on your numbers of of uh, people that are actually uh, playing tennis now. Is it? Cause I'm a bit confused. Is it that they're playing in clubs or they're playing tennis? Are they join clubs or, or what exactly are the figures? So um. Good question, Peter. So let me take um, the 5.6 million number I gave you, which is just for clarity, the number of adults age 16 plus um, playing tennis at least once a year in a, in a 12 month period. Um, of that 5.6 million, about 2.1 million of that 5.6 actually play in parks. About 1.3 million play in tennis clubs with the remainder playing in other tennis facilities, be that um, community indoor tennis centers, be that in education facilities such as universities, um, be that in leisure centers. So that gives you some indication in terms of that 5.6 million, the majority of that 5.6 million, like I 2.1 play in parks, 1.3 play in tennis clubs. What I would say though, is that the other number I gave you, or one of the other numbers, uh, numbers I gave you, was the number of adults playing monthly. So that's more of a frequency metric. That's that's two point six million. So half of that two point six million are playing in clubs. So you know that that gives you some indication as to the significant role that the club landscape plays. But equally, which I think is a positive sign, um, tennis is being played elsewhere as well. The reason I ask that is because we we do pay and play. And um, obviously, we've done really well at it. It's, it's really worked well for us. Um, but very few of those people have actually joined the club. Mm -hmm. So they're playing tennis, but they're not joining their club. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got facilities there that we have to pay for. Obviously, we charge yeah. on pay and play, but they're not joining our club. And that's what my, my fear is, that more and more people go to parks, more and more people pay and play. And as a club, we, we just don't get the members. And our membership hasn't really increased that much it sort of stays fairly stable which is good i accept that's good but it's not actually increased by any and certainly for ladies playing tennis that's just absolutely hopeless really you know we've had to drop i've run the milton Keynes leagues and we've had to drop one of our divisions because we just haven't got enough ladies playing 
Yeah, look, it's a, it's a, it's a really good point. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the pay and play aspect. I, I would suspect that quite a significant um, element of the growth that we've seen in the number of people playing in clubs, so I mentioned some 800,000 five years ago, 1.3 <clears> million now, has come from more clubs opening up their, their facilities to the local community on a pay and play basis, which is really, really positive. Now, what we have seen is that, unlike your experience, a number of those people have gone on to become members of tennis clubs because we have seen club membership also increase over this period of time. I'm not saying that's universal um, across Britain, but you know there are clubs who have been quite successful in terms of converting pay and play um, players <laughs> into members. I'm not saying it's easy. Um, I'm not saying everyone will want, will want to do that, but I think some clubs who have been successful in that have looked at flexible membership options. So rather than an annual subscription, looking at kind of flexible memberships, looking at family membership um, options as well. So that, that, that's an interesting thing to consider. Um, on the parks point, um, look, parks play a really important role. And it's great that there's a number of people who can access tennis, um, you know, uh, in parks. Uh, and we're lucky to have a very significant stock of tennis courts in parks up and down the country. I, I think actually it's a positive thing for all aspects of the sport because my, my suspicion is that once more people start playing in parks and start to improve their level and start to get into the sport a bit more, they're going to start to look for other things in tennis that perhaps a park <clears> site <throat> can't provide them with. And they might have to go to look at clubs in order to get that, whether that is you know, being part of a team and entering local leagues or whether it's everything that goes with being as part of a club. So actually, I, I do actually see there being opportunities uh, down the road for clubs in respect of capitalising on the growth that we're seeing in parks. Um, so that those are just a couple of points that I would that I would that I would kind of say in response to, to, your, to your question. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Maggie Hodges, did you have a question or did you change your mind? You're on mute still, Maggie. Yes, sorry, um, I did. Um, it was actually- Remind uh, us where you're uh, from, Maggie, I know. Oh, sorry, Maggie Hodges, um, and Trolls Tennis Club in Angus, Scotland. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned about safeguarding, um, for small clubs, I mean, there is a massive amount of uh, templates, uh, all sorts of things on the LTA, LTA website, but it really is a huge amount of work for very small clubs to update policies. I mean, we went actually went through a safeguarding review with Ten Scotland last summer, uh, which we had everything green, but it took months and months of work. It's, safeguarding is, is a huge issue and I, I really, you know, do appreciate that. But it, it's becoming a huge burden on very small clubs. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure if I have a question or whether I just want some comments. No, no, look, I mean, look, Maggie, I, I, I mean, very nice to meet you and you make a, a really, really good point. Um, you know, I, I, we completely appreciate the volume and depth of work that's involved um, in adhering to some of the standards that we put in place around safeguarding um, and appreciate that it takes a lot of time, energy and efforts to adhere to those standards. I, I hope and would like to think that via Tennis Scotland, there is the support available to help you through the process. And, and if not, that's something I'm happy to kind of pick up on. Um, but you're absolutely right that you know, almost, you know, every couple of months, there's, you know, some, you know, worrying news about a safeguarding matter yeah. in being one sport or another. I mean, I think it was only yesterday or today that I saw um, a report around Swim England and, and, and swimming. Mm. Um, you know, that's, you know, on top of what's happened in British gymnastics, that's on top of you know, what happened in football and the historic abuse that's been seen in that sport. Um, 
and, and actually, um, I, I was on a meeting or on a, on a call with um, Sport England not so long ago, and their CEO was saying that most of his time at the moment is taken up by trying to help sports through some of the safeguarding challenges that they're experiencing. So, so why do I say all that? I say it because I absolutely appreciate it. it's it's hard work, and you know, please be assured that we're trying to do all that we can do to try and streamline our processes trying to trying to kind of support you through it um but i suppose we make no apologies for the rigor th through which we approach this topic because if we don't get it right as a sport then the consequences can be quite catastrophic for the sport yeah. and every, everyone would feel that volunteers would feel it clubs would feel it in terms of their membership it, it, it would be very far reaching so absolutely appreciate that it's hard work um really thank you for all your efforts in that regard we we do try and make it increasingly as 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 kind of um not not easy it's never going to be easy but try and reduce the admin burden as far as we possibly can and i know there's more we can do in that regard um but i think it's a very valid comment to make thank you and thank you maggie for bringing that to the table tonight because it's it is something which is very onerous upon many a club, as you've illustrated, and one that Ollie understands and the LTA do understand. Uh, Anne Mumford, please come in. Hi, uh, Anne Mumford here from uh, Rosalie Alton Hope Tennis Club in Leicestershire. Um, I'd just like to welcome the comment that you made about IT systems. Um, certainly in the county and also within clubs, there have been a lot of challenges in the data that um, is in both the LTA system and the club spot databases that we may use and the uh, whether those are aligned or not. And certainly when we're doing venue registration, um, there are some challenges with the, the list of advantage members and the uh, veracity of that data. So I just wanted to say that I hope things are moving forward in that area because they've certainly caused um, quite a lot of work, I think, in terms of players not being able to be found or seeming to disappear and then come back again uh, when we've been putting in league results. So certainly welcome that and I just hope that things are going to improve. Thank you. No, look, uh, again, Anne, look, it's, it's a very valid comment. Um, I know that actually Peter, because I've, I've, I've spoken to Peter previously would have a similar view about some of our systems in respect of competition um, and look I'm not making any excuses but we have been through over the last few years quite a significant change in terms of ripping out in kind of layperson's terms our historic and very aging and unsupported technology infrastructure and putting in place a brand new infrastructure and there's been some teething problems and some growing pains in respect to that process more broadly however we now have a much more robust um, uh, up-to-date intuitive um, system uh, that now enables us to one ensure greater levels of reliability but also enable us to build exciting and hopefully engaging digital products and services off the back of it uh, which hopefully will benefit all of you going forward so completely appreciate the point understand it I, I think we're in a better place now um we, we've got through hopefully the worst of it and it does give us the platform to ensure that existing products and services are optimized and improved and are more resilient but also um, think about how we can continue to deliver new and better services whether that's in competition whether that's for you know club administrators um, whether that's actually for the end user in terms of finding tennis courts and booking and paying for them so thank you for your for your comments great thank you Anne. uh john radcliffe please come in thank you very much simon and thank you ollie for that presentation uh tonight i find it fascinating my name is john radcliffe i'm chair of directors at shooters who Lawn tennis club which is an inner city uh tennis club in greenwich the borough of greenwich unusual because there aren't many inner city tennis clubs uh, uh all as you know, it's very much a home counties uh, um, and uh, embedded in traditional uh, traditional areas uh, uh, of the country. And you, tennis has to be congratulated, really. I remember coming to tennis in the early 
the turn of the millennium from uh, management in the Football Association and coming and joining uh, tennis because my, my son was playing at a very fairly high level and I became involved for the very first time. I found it fascinating to see how you could actually get more points but lose a match. <laughs> Ollie will probably know much about that. But it's brought me into the game and I spent nine years on the board of management of Kent before I've had to come off now because of the Sport England rules. But what I have seen in those years is that the participation, the change from this elitist approach um, to one which is less elitist. It's still held uh, in the eyes of quite a few people within the country as an elitist sport. And I remember having to answer a question live on the television, sorry, on the radio. The first question was, how are you going to address elitism in tennis? Called at 8.30 in the morning. But that's the type of thing that we're trying to break. But, Oli, what you have done is the programme going into schools, fantastic. The programme of opening up in the inner city areas through the parks. You've fallen on your feet a little bit with Sport England giving you £28 million, but you've used that wisely to invest in the facilities that were there and to develop those facilities. And the team you put in place to put that in practice across the country <coughs> as being first class, and they have delivered and you're now at a very important junction. I haven't got an answer for you for this, Ollie, but from a club point of view, we are bursting at the seams. We can take no more members. But we, what we've done off our own back is to go and talk to the local university to get into partnership with them so we can use their outdoor facilities and now begin the work of trying to develop an indoor centre on their site. But also in Greenwich, there are eight new parks courts about to come into the system over the next nine months. But how on earth do we, as a club, link up with these parks facilities? The team which has been put in place is now being dismantled and going back into the regional teams, which are going through a major reorganisation. I don't know who's sitting where at the moment, and this is a crucial point. If we don't develop the links between all these new park areas across the country and our local clubs, we're not going to get that movement of people playing tennis successfully. Those who want to move to a higher level or going to clubs can do so. But at the moment, I think there's a big question, Ollie. How are we going to get that link between these fantastic facilities and the fantastic clubs that we have embedded across the country? Uh, thank, thanks very much, John, um, for your positive comments. And there, there was a lot in kind of what you just covered there. Um, so, look, um, you know, Yes, look, thank you for the reference around the LTA youth programme and, and the work we've done to go into schools. For those who aren't aware, we have trained up over 18,000 primary and secondary school teachers to deliver tennis in a school environment. That is across some half of the 22,000 odd schools in the whole of Britain. That's primary, secondary and special schools. Um, and that's a really, really significant programme um, uh, of work, which has been recognised by the Department for Education, amongst others. Um, the parks opportunity, um, you're right, we did. Um, you know, we have benefited from £22 million pounds from, from government with a, with a further kind of £8 to £10 million pounds from the LTA Tennis Foundation. Um, and that does present a huge opportunity um, uh, and which we are seeing the success, i.e. growth in the number of people playing in parks. Specifically, though, your point and your question about how do we ensure that we connect like you know opportunities for people to play locally that is a huge huge focus for us over the next three years so i suppose taking a couple of those areas in turn you know it's great that we've got lots of children enjoying tennis in schools but how do we ensure that we provide them with other opportunities to play outside of the school environment because it's one thing having a taste of tennis you know in a classroom or on a playground area but then if that child and their parent wants to continue to, you know, uh, enjoy playing tennis, they're going to have to look outside of the school environment. So how we create um, connections and meaningful links between schools and local tennis facilities, be that a park site or be that a tennis club, is really, really important. And there's lots more work to be done there. When it comes to park sites themselves, one of the uh, elements of our investment programme 
has been not only to upgrade and refurbish the park courts that need refurbishing and putting in the booking system so that people can find and book them and access them easily. Um, it's also about ensuring they are sustainable for the long term. And to do that, we're putting in operators in all of those park sites. So whether that's a coach operator, whether that's um, a local tennis club, and actually a number of tennis clubs are doing this, to operate and manage the park courts to maximise the return that we can get from that. And I think it does come down to the local linkages and relationships there are on the ground. And that will be a, you mentioned it, but that will be a key part of the role of the, of the LTA regional team, the LTA local delivery team, who are at the moment going through a little bit of change. But actually, it's all for the good reasons or all for the best intentions, John. Actually, it's to ensure that we have the right people in the right roles to actually do exactly what you've just said. Another example would be, you know, the fact that our serves program, which you've probably heard of, that takes tennis into hard to reach or underserved communities to give people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity because of their circumstances to enjoy the benefits of tennis. We've reached, you know, almost 30,000 children through that program over the last 12 months. Um, and how we then connect those children to local opportunities to play, whether that's at a park as part of a free park tennis session that we're running, or whether it's at a local club through an engagement program that they might have, that is really, really important. And it's our role um, to help try and facilitate that. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Rianne, please come in. I think you're on mute, Rianne. You are still on mute. I'll, I will try and unmute you. Sorry. Yeah, you're there now. <laughs> Sorry, I'd hidden the um, thing on the top of the screen. <laughs> right. Um, I'm Rianne. I'm from Me Tennis. A couple of points, questions, comments. Um, I just wondered, there, there's so much frustration with the Club Spark system, particularly at the time of venue re-registration. Um, do the LTA um, fund apprenticeships, you know, IT apprenticeships to help get the, there seems to be a lot of changes suggested, but they're very slow have been implemented. And if not, would that be something that you may consider to get, you know, something that works for more people so look um again i would say first of all that i acknowledge some of the challenges that volunteers have had and continue to have perhaps with aspects of club spark functionality we i suppose just to give you some some reassurance we are very aware of those as a result we have um put in place um tougher service level agreements with club spark so what that means is that they have to deliver certain levels of service in the products that they provide to volunteers and coaches and others in order to be compliant with and adhere to the agreement that we have in place with them so we are ma managing their delivery in a tighter way than perhaps we have in the past but we're also going to look at how we can better engage with the volunteer network um, both at a county and a venue level in order to help prioritize the development backlog for Club Spark. Because I agree with you that there's lots of good ideas about how the platform can and should be improved, not just in terms of its resilience, but in terms of its functionality, quite yeah. importantly. Um, and it does seem sometimes to take a little bit of time to actually work through that, that, that list of ideas. So um, we, we are going to be setting up through um, one of our kind of board subcommittees, um, a, a kind of a think tank, if you like, to bring together some county and venue volunteers to help dig into a little bit more detail as to what's causing the pain points for you in respect to the Club Spark, and then try and prioritise better the development backlog for Club Spark in that regard and based on that feedback. So watch this space on that front. What I do know is I do know that they do obviously take on board the feedback they receive. I think I'm aware that on the Club Spark platform, you can actually identify and put in your requests for feature and functionality development, um, which they which they do work through. But uh, I completely understand your point and we do need to have a better process to understand how we better prioritize that, that development roadmap. 
and then hold club spike to account to deliver against it. Um, you know, if you take a step back, um, you know, hopefully, generally speaking, the fact that a system like Club Spark is provided as part of a registration package. So for, you know, hopefully better value than you might be able to get if you went out to a provider directly. And it does have functionality to help a club manage its membership, manage its bookings, it has a website module. Um, hopefully that is a positive thing as a whole, but I do understand the frustrations when it doesn't work as effectively as it should do. And when some of the development doesn't happen as quickly as you would like it to. So we are aware of that and we need to continue to work on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, P Peter Wilson, there are two of you. So I don't know who wants to ask the question. Do you want to come off mute, please? Hello, I'm Jane Wilson. Um, I'm from Plimpton Tennis Club, which is just outside Plymouth in Devon. Um, I'm a coach, I'm also a committee member and do lots of volunteering in the club. Um, I just wanted to ask us, I've run a number of LTA youth start courses and we have an indoor venue which we can use, which is really good, but it's not ours. We have to pay to use it. I'm running youth start. It's really a, a loss leader for me at the moment and the, the price hasn't increased for ages. So... Is that going to change? So I suppose, um, I mean, look, great, great that you're um, engaging with the youth program. Thank you very much for your support with that. Great you're running LTA Youth Start courses. Um, you know, I, I, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the kind of business model around that, obviously the idea is that hopefully once those individuals have, you know, experienced tennis through LTA Youth Start, that they then might be encouraged to continue within that venue's program um, and maybe become a member of that venue and therefore create an ongoing income stream for the coach as part of as part of the work that you do now you know i don't i know that's not always the case but but that is what a lot of coaches do see in terms of um you know participants who go into that start program that introductory program to tennis they see that actually they manage to convert quite a number of those children into ongoing junior programs and if that is something that you're struggling with a little bit and therefore feeling that it's not delivering a financial return, very happy that we kind of support in kind of looking at what you're doing and what you could do to try and drive that a little bit better. Um, so if, if that if that's something that, that, that you want some support with or want us to connect with you on outside of this, then ask. I'm guessing the shake of the head means no. <laughs> um, but, but, um, but, you, you know, the, the idea is that we, we provide the content to deliver a really positive experience um, and that hopefully it hooks the kid on tennis and gets them to want to play a bit more. That That's the concept of it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I understand that. I think for us, it's the jump in price because we're an indoor venue and parents see it as, well, good value and the children generally are very positive and enjoy it. But then when you say it's going to cost you this much more, the parents will go off and do cricket, who are also offering a similar mm -hmm. cut price introduction or football or rugby. <laughs> and we do get some people coming back, obviously, but it's just that there's such a big gap because the price hasn't gone up for what, well, since it started. So, yeah, so everything has increased in price, but it, this hasn't matched it. So that that's my issue, really. Okay, no, that, that's that's a fair point. Let let me let me take that away. I'm just going to turn back on the lights in here because they're on a sensor. <laughs> so I'm you've gone very, you've got very dark suddenly, Ollie. <laughs> um, Ollie. I think Ollie may have run away, but he's gone completely blank. He'll be back in a moment, though, as he says. Probably having a little break. There we go. I just had to I had to get the lights switched back. <laughs> We've got lots more questions for you, Ollie. One thing on the chat which people have come through to is your use of acronyms. So CITCs, LTA, VMOST, MEs, LSEGs, LAs. People don't always know exactly what they stand for. They're just one to consider. Uh, uh, yeah, look, look, sorry. That that's kind of my, my bad habits. Um, you know, I'm 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 very happy to <laughs> to explain what I mean by them. Um if someone reminds me of the list, but CITCs are community indoor tennis centers. Um, 
Uh, VMO stands for vision, mission, objective, strategies, and tactics. Um, what were the other ones? MEs. Uh, major events, maybe. I can't remember in which context MEs came up. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe it may be major events. I can't remember which, which LSEGs, LSEGs, so lower socioeconomic groups and LAs, local authorities. Yeah, that's a good one. And LTA, I think we all know. All right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, Caroline Radcliffe, please come in. Can we see you tonight? Yes, we can. Uh, hello, I'm Caroline Radcliffe. With the other half of John, I'm the secretary of the club. Um, I just wanted to ask something about um, Club Spark. I know you've been honest. We don't do a membership because we don't find them. Um, uh, they don't answer our questions quickly enough. And we've got too many things that it makes it too complicated. So we don't do a uh, membership through there. But on the registration this year, which is great, fantastic. You can do it all and it's really easy. But you're meant to be able to, once you've registered, change any things that happen within your club. And I can't do it and I've asked them and no one answers me and I've asked them again and I still can't I've had coaches change I've had volunteers change and I can't take them off for some reason it says that only the administrator can take them off and I'm thinking this is not very helpful if I can't keep everything up to date now I don't know if something's changed but it used to work it doesn't now so I just find you know sometimes club spark is fantastic you actually speak to someone immediately and they'll get back to you but sometimes it can take days and if you haven't got a, a system that actually responds to you, you don't want to use it. If you did that in a club, if you as a, as a member did it in a club, you wouldn't be in that club anymore. So I just feel, particularly with the registration this year, I don't know what's going on. I really have given up with it. Okay. I don't understand it. Thank you, Caroline. I, I suppose I'd just say, Caroline, and you, you were cutting in and, out, in and out a little bit there, but um, Sorry. no, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, look. I'm very happy. It sounds like you've got quite a specific issue with some functionality not working. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very happy that you contact me at, out, you know, outside of this forum. Simon can give you my e email address and I can try and connect you with the right, you know, people to follow up. On, on the issue. Okay. I'm very happy to try and facilitate that. That's great. Cause I think it's quite a specific question there. So thank you, Caroline. Uh, Pete Jarvis, please come in. Uh, thanks. Yeah, Pete Jarvis, um, formerly of the West Hans Club, where, Oli, I know you were uh, on the board for many years. Um, I've got a question on the social media stuff. I, th I think um, it seems to be everything I see seems to be about performance tennis, which is great. But is the LTA going to pivot and start putting some stuff around the other three pillars, which I think are, you know, participation and I can't remember what the other one was, but uh, it seems to be solely focusing on performance, which maybe is missing what the LTA is all about. <laughs> yeah look um i think it's a fair observation what i would point out um though peter is that um y y we've had a very specific strategy and approach around social media and that has been to try and grow the volume of followers of our social media channels and the volume of interactions that we get across those channels and we've been actually very, very successful at doing that. Don't ask me to quote the numbers at you because I haven't got them at my fingertips, but we have significantly- I certainly wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> the number of followers um, and we've significantly grown the number of interactions. And, you know, in order to do that, we've had to focus our content um, on those channels to best engage with the widest possible audience. And in order to do that, that content has necessarily had to be, I suppose, more fan orientated, which does include, um, you know, performance of top British players. And so that has been a very deliberate strategy such that we can really, really grow the volumes. Um, you know, going forward, we have to think about how we might need to pivot that approach to engage with other cohorts um, across tennis. What I would say is that, you know, this forum here or the tennis volunteer community group housed on Facebook is a really good example of, in effect, another social media channel, just a closed Facebook channel. Simon will be able to articulate it better than I, which we have helped to enable Simon and others to put into place, which now has, what, some 2000 members of it um, yeah. and provides 
you know, a, a social media channel through which volunteers can engage, not only through sessions like this, but actually on a day to day basis in terms of helping them with questions and challenges they're, they're, they're experiencing across the sport. We have something very similar for coaches in a number of different areas. So we, we haven't been doing nothing in respect of our social media approach to other key audiences, but we've been doing it in a quite a closed and specific way, um, deliberately around um, enabling those volunteers and coaches to better connect with each other. Um, but that 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 is the answer to why our LTA social media channels are, are you know serve up content as you've described because we've been focused on driving the volume of followers and interactions across those channels. But as you get more followers, are you going to move to the other two areas of? It, it just seems odd that you're 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 setting yourself a target of followers and you're going after increasing that target the easiest way, which is Emma and Katie and Andy and those guys, where you're leaving behind the other key parts of what the LTA is all about. That's just a, a, a thought. Yeah, you, look, look, and it's a it, it's a I think a fair thought in some respects. My my only challenge back would be obviously there are other channels that we use regularly to communicate with other uh, areas of our sport right so it's not that we have a complete radio silence in terms of our communication channels to coaches to volunteers to officials we have other channels that we use be that our website be that email um that that are absolutely vital in terms of communicating and engaging with those, those, those audiences and actually we get really good traction and engagement through in terms of our open and click through rates for email for certain audiences like volunteers and coaches it's massively above industry standards as as i would hope and expect because you're communicating to an engaged audience um so take the point about social media i've tried to describe why it is as it is in terms of where, where our focus has been but you know please be assured we have other channels to communicate with other audiences and absolutely social media needs to be a consideration going forward as to how it can play a role in supporting our communication with coaches and volunteers and the more traditional delivery channels in tennis. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie. Thank you very much. Okay. Any more questions at this stage? Anyone else want to put their hands up? Okay. So one question, Ollie, which people often come to me and ask is that this particular plan from my perspective, looks great at a macro level, but it's taking it down to grassroots level and that micro level, which you've mentioned, obviously, the regional team and the rejigged regional team, who are going to have a lot on their plate to get around all clubs and venues, which, quite frankly, isn't realistic. How are grassroots clubs going to see any difference or any change from what has come before at a micro level? going forward will they be impacted will they see a change are you reliant on the counties to some extent how are they going to see improvements even better things happening yeah look it's a it's a good question simon so um i suppose first of all i would like to think that uh, over the course of the last five years um you know generally speaking um there's some level of positivity around engagement with the LTA if you're if you're a tennis club. Um, certainly, as a whole, we've seen tennis clubs thrive, particularly um, post COVID, in terms of the volumes of members and players that they have. Um, and I would like to think that we've played our small part in that. Now, whether that's the work we've done to market the sport and drive more interest in it and therefore more people to tennis clubs, whether that has been the venue support toolkit we put in place and the information resources, the LTA buying group that exists as part of that uh, resource, the, um, you know, Brabner's helpline for legal advice, um, that, that that kind of online toolkit of support for venues has been a big focus for us. And we've built that out quite considerably over the last four or five years and expect to continue to do the same um, over the coming three years. So increasingly wanting to react to what venues and volunteers want more help and support with, and then trying to adapt our approach and our information and materials accordingly, absolutely will continue. Um, obviously, our employed regional team um, are there, as actually was very 
articulately put by, by John earlier in terms of helping to connect local opportunities or opportunities locally for more people to engage with the sport, whether that's through schools, whether that's through tennis clubs, whether that's in park sites and helping to make, I suppose, on a local area basis, tennis thrive. And actually, as our, as our mission says, try to transform communities through tennis. Um, that, that, that is what we're ultimately trying to achieve over the next three years. And, and obviously clubs continue to play a, a key part in that. And the other thing I would point to, which has been you know, a, a recurring theme of questions over the last 20 minutes or so around things like ClubSpark and our digital infrastructure. And that has been and will continue to be a big focus for us because we want to make sure that we're doing all that we can to make sure everyone's experience of tennis be that a player, be that a fan, be that a volunteer, be that a coach, um, is as good as it can be. Um, so hopefully that gives you some sense as to, you know, some of the things we, we have done, hopefully that you've all felt um, and what we want to continue to do um, going forward over the, over, over the next three years. Um, and look, I suppose taking it again, a step back, um, you know, those stats that I mentioned as part of the presentation, like, you should all be so proud that the sport that you hopefully love and enjoy and, you know, commit time and effort to is growing. Not, not many sports have grown over the last five years. In fact, a lot have declined and to have a sport or be part of a sport that has seen the growth that we have seen and therefore the opportunity that we think exists to grow that further um, and interesting opportunities through other formats of the game as well. I think really, really exciting. Um, I think it's a great place to be. Um, and that's in no small part down to all your hard effort and work. Okay, thank you, Ollie. I think from my perspective, clubs have got great volunteers running their clubs on a day-to-day -day basis. I think you're doing great stuff at a macro level. And I think over a period of time, if you can set expectations to those clubs of what they can expect, what support they can expect. They then don't, they can just get on with what they do so well and they know what to come to you at for and they know what to get on with on their own. So it's it's setting expectations. I'm gonna carry on with some more questions. So we've got David, uh, please come in, David Tonner. You need to come off mute to David, please. There we go, How's that? I'm David Tonner. Uh, I'm the chair of a small two-court rural club in Gloucestershire, Cerny Lakes. And I also uh, sit on the county league committee. Um, I've just got a couple of comments about the previous uh, questions. Um, I think the technology that the LTA provide actually is pretty good stuff. Uh, I've worked in the technology industry for 40 years, and we find ClubSpark extremely robust. It's easy to use. And it just has taken away so much tiresome administration from the, uh, the club committee, you know, in terms of collecting membership fees, booking courts. You know, we used to have to do our book. It's just a great system. No system is ever perfect. There's always suggestions for changes. Changes always take a long time in a system which have, must have thousands of users across the country. So any change has to be really carefully uh, implemented. So I think the LTA have done a good job. And I know that they're also, the LTA are about to release a new um, league planner. I have seen it in, in Kent where it's been in use. Uh, it's just a great piece of software. So I, I do commend the LTA for their technology strategy. Uh, I wanted to make a point about the strategy though, as this is what it's about. Um, first, uh, earlier on in um, uh, Ollie's presentation, you had that um, circular triangle of fans participation and um, performance. Um, I think I was impressed by that. I think it's crucial that, um, that that kind of circle is maintained because obviously, you know, running the club, trying to encourage people to come, trying to encourage new members to come in uh, and keep the, the current membership. Um, important, it really is important that there's a lot of chat in the club about how players are doing, uh, how our GB players are doing in the world. You know, uh, and the Wimbledon tickets going to Wimbledon, going to uh, the other competitions. Uh, loads of chat about that. And at the moment, there's quite a lot of negative chat. And I know that Ollie probably can't do anything about it, or the LTA can't, about the TV coverage of tennis. 
because, you know, for a number of years now, members have been able to follow pretty closely um, tennis uh, championships around the world. Um, and then Sky lost it, Amazon took it, and now it's kind of back with Sky, but the actual method of subscribing seems to be quite difficult. The coverage was great at Sky and really poor at Amazon. They just got it right and they gave up, and now Sky, it's just a mess. And I just would say to the LTA that that has really got to be right because that TV coverage is what people is where people get involved in the kind of global community of tennis and feel they're really part of something bigger than our little two court club in uh, a village in uh, in Gloucestershire. That's that's what I was going to say. Okay, thank you, David. Well, well, David, if, if I I mean Simon, is it okay if I just respond briefly? Um, Please. I mean, David, look, firstly, thank you very much for your positive comments. Um, really appreciate that really appreciate the feedback um and thank you for all the work that you do um you're absolutely right that um you know the the, the kind of visibility of of tennis is fundamentally important to um so many areas of the sport but particularly we know that visibility has um a direct impact on driving um more people to play tennis so all that we can do to increase the visibility of tennis. Um, and you're also right in saying that not all of that is within our control, but what we can control, we are absolutely committed to focusing on. So you wouldn't have had time to kind of look at it because the, the slide wasn't up there for long enough. But um, what, one of the final slides that I put up, which showed what I called a number of tactics, the areas of work under each of those six strategies that we're looking to focus on. Um, the, the, the one which is number five, actually, um, is to increase the visibility of tennis through broadcast and media partnerships. So we absolutely recognize the importance of having tennis accessible to people um, through ideally terrestrial TV channels. Um, and, and that's going to be a key part of our, of our strategy going forward, um, as well as obviously ensuring that we increase the visibility through you know, other channels, such as the content that we create for our channels to Peter's point about social media, um, brand marketing campaigns and other things. Um, and again, so, so I suppose kind of pick up a couple of specific examples um, to, to kind of demonstrate, um, you know, the work that we do to try and ensure that people can watch tennis on TV. So we, we obviously have committed to and continue to commit to the BBC to show Queens and Eastbourne. That is really, really important to us because we know that, you know, it does all the things that you've just described. So um, that, that, that is, you know, a really key kind of element of, of what we, we look to continue to do. Another example is actually when Amir Raducanu got to the U S open final um, we played quite an important part behind the scenes in helping to broker the kind of deal with um, Amazon Prime to, in effect, sub-license the rights for the final to terrestrial TV. And that meant that some 10 million people watched Emma's final, um, which might not have been the case if it was purely on Amazon Prime. So that's just another example, hopefully to demonstrate that we absolutely agree with your points. Um, it was very well made and it's a really important part of our of our plan for the next three years. Thanks. Okay, Rianne, please. Hi. Um, we're a four court venue, used to be six, um, that are converting one of the courts into three pickable courts this year um, and that's because we've had over 500 people since we run the pickable taster sessions in August between August and January we had over 500 people attending the sessions and it just makes financial sense to me to get 12 people on court instead of four um, and you know sessions are booked a weeks in advance and I don't know. I, I don't think Nice is on its own there um, with the popularity of the sport. You seem to mention more about paddle than you do pickleball. And is it going to come under the LTA as well? It, it, you know, when can we see it having as much attention as the paddle? Because it seems an easy sport. We have players from 12 years old to nearly 80 playing together. 
it's easy, people pick it up quickly. Um, you know, it seems to be what what it needs. It's got elements of tennis on it. I know it's not tennis, and a lot of tennis players don't like it. But for us, it, it brings an important revenue in. Yeah, look, it's a it's a really um it's a really, really good question. Um so I suppose to answer it directly in respect of pickleball. Um, we do feel that pickleball has an important role to play in delivering against our vision of opening the sport up to more people. Um, you've hit the nail on the head that um, it is easier to play than tennis. Um, it is easier from an infrastructure perspective. You don't have the capital cost of paddle because you can set pickleball courts up on a tennis court. Um, the number I gave you earlier on of 5.6 million adults who play tennis at least once a year, when you, uh, and that's about 11% of the population of Britain, when you break that down by age demographic, for the over 55 market, it's 3%. And so I know pickleball is not just predisposed to an older demographic, but in the US, where it's very big, some 14 million people play in the US, pickleball that is, um, it is a slightly older demographic that play, probably because it's a smaller core, easier to move, less stress on the joints and the limbs, etc. So we see pickleball as a, as a huge opportunity to engage with new and different audiences, particularly those of a slightly older demographic. Um, we also feel there's lots of synergies with, with venues, right? I mean, the fact that you can probably program pickleball on your courts at quieter times throughout the day when tennis isn't in such high demand is only going to be a good thing for the club and create mm. you know additional revenue streams and therefore we are going through the process of trying to be recognized as the governing body through sport england you might have seen some stuff played out in the media recently that there is an existing entity called pickleball england have done a you know a good job for the last few years in terms of um the work they've done on pickleball but we feel for lots of different reasons not least the fact that We've already mentioned that a lot of pickleball already takes place at tennis venues. We want to make it really easy for volunteers. We don't think volunteers should be answerable to two governing bodies. It's already difficult enough. <laughs> you, you should just be going through the LTA. Um, we feel that our resources, both human and financial, mean that we're in a better position to invest in pickleball for the long term. Um, to grow it in a complementary way to tennis, that's really, really important. We don't want pickleball to cannibalize tennis. We want them both to grow in a complementary way and we feel that we're best placed to do that. And so, yes, we are interested. Yes, we are trying to work through the process to become recognised. Um, it's not straightforward. Um, it's not within our gift, but we are keen for those reasons. Uh, and I think it's a very good point. Well made. OK, thank you. Ryan. Thank you. Uh, Ollie, are you still OK for a few more questions? They're still coming in. Yeah, no, no problem. As long as long as you all are. <laughs> they're still still listening andrew please come in andrew payne hi Ali. thank you first of all for coming out tonight and uh doing this i'm andrew payne i'm the chair of Marlborough tennis which is six core 301 member tennis club uh in wiltshire so a rural outdoor club um my kind of plea for you is one of the things that we've been trying to do is do a lot more forward planning in our club so we're a three-year business plan in a very very long term cash flow forecast one of the frustrations i've got is is campaign marketing and events that are launched by the lta at relatively short notice and as volunteers we probably need about three times longer than most other people do because we're doing this on the side so my plea would be can you can you ask generally colleagues to pull together a one page overview of all the new programs that the lta is planning to launch for the next year ahead, so that we've all got a heads up, so we've got adequate time to plan, so we can run our own campaigns that are customized to our own audiences, etc. Yeah, um, Andrew, hi, very nice to meet you virtually. Um, um, thanks for all the work that you do. Great, great question and a very fair point. I mean, obviously we do strive as far as we can to ensure that we give, you know, some level of notice as to campaigns that we're running to ensure that venues like yourselves can try to capitalize on those but i completely appreciate that um more time would always be beneficial so i take i take the feedback i i, I 
definitely understand it and we will see what we can do better because you know obviously the the reason why we invest in these campaigns whether they be marketing out campaigns or content campaigns or whatever they might be new programs is to try and support all of you to grow the volume of players and members at your facilities and i completely understand that having enough time to understand what we're doing and when it's landing and therefore work out how you can try and capitalize and take advantage of that is really really important so it's a, it's a it's a really fair point okay uh maggie please come in hi sorry to trouble you again um going back to your point about lower socio socioeconomic groups um it's something that is is very very dear to my heart and our clubs but we find the problem is we 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 have done a a, a postcode, uh, whatever it's called, to find out where our members live, which areas are not served, etc. We are a a rural town, um, and there are pockets of social deprivation which we're very aware of, but how can we engage? those areas we do go into schools and we do get tennis taster sessions etc but obviously we have to find money to um fund programs and it's getting harder and harder each year to do that so is there any help that the lta can give to try and engage those lower socioeconomic groups yeah well i mean look um I'm really pleased to hear that it's a topic close to your heart and it sounds like you're trying to do all the right things. So look, really, really well done. And from a kind of macro point, um, you know, I'm still very aware that some of the perceptions of tennis might be a little bit, well, it's, you know, predominantly white, middle class and not for me, but mm. hopefully we are collectively breaking that down a little bit. And I am really passionate about the fact that tennis really can be a sport for anyone and it should be a sport for anyone who wants to get involved and hence the kind of rationale behind our our vision of wanting to open the sport up to anyone who wants to get involved be that a volunteer a coach a player a fan whoever um specifically though it, it's it's not straightforward right it's it's not an easy nut to crack um a few things that i would reference um you know we, we we do run and Tennis Scotland do run the LTA Serves programme. That is a programme that yeah. we underwrite the cost of. We actually receive money from Sport England to, 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 to fund or Sport England to fund it as well. Um, and that enables tennis to be delivered for free for people in the most deprived communities. We train up local activators in those areas. We give them the skills, the resources, the training, the equipment to then deliver tennis in church halls, mosques faith centers community centers um and that's really really positive in terms of um you know the engagement we've had it's it's one of the largest programs across sport in terms of engaging with lower socioeconomic groups the challenge is if those children want to play a bit more where where do they go to i suppose you might not be surprised that one of the things i would point to in that respect is is our parks investment program you know, we know that um, more families play in parks, more women play in parks, actually, and more people from lower socioeconomic groups play in parks because it's more accessible, because it's more affordable. And so one thing we are absolutely trying to do is trying to connect, again, back to John's point earlier, you know, those children who have the chance to play in school or in the SERS program, how do we connect them in a, in a kind of seamless way to other opportunities to play locally? So Again, just as a reminder, as part of our investment into parks, we, we are requiring every local authority that we invest into as part of a contractual agreement, they must run a free weekly tennis session um, on a Saturday morning um, after park runs finished. <laughs> um, and the idea of that is that it, it enables tennis to be accessible to anyone because it's free. It's about facilitated play, come down, whatever your age, whatever your background, um, you know, whatever your ability level, have fun playing tennis. And so trying to profile and promote those opportunities and connect local cohorts of our communities to those is going to be really, really important. As I said, it's not straightforward. There's not 
an easy answer, but there are things that we're doing. And as I said, it's really pleasing to see in those participation stats that I've referenced, although the absolute numbers are of course higher amongst an ABC1 audience, i.e. a higher social demographic, um, the, purport, the, 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 the growth has been proportionally higher amongst a lower demographic audience, which makes me think we're doing some of the right things as a sport, whether you're a tennis club trying to initiate your own programs to engage cohorts of your local community that can't afford to otherwise play the sport, or whether it's the parks program, or whether it's the serves program, there are good things happening. And it and it's just doing more of the same in my view. Um, so hopefully that in part answers some of your question. Yeah, we have no parks. The nearest one is 20 miles away. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I suppose, um, you know, without going into lots of detail, there are pockets of money that do exist that um, clubs and organisations can, can can tap into. We, we actually partner with a company called Oaks, who works on our, who work on our service program, particularly to help serves organisations unlock local pots of money to help facilitate play and activity for the most deprived people in in their communities, and. You know, that that is something that, you know, if you've got a local SERS program that you, I don't know whether you have or whether you can speak to Tennis Scotland, they might be able to point you in the direction whereby you might be able to unlock some some local funding um, to enable you to deliver a program that might be about bringing those children from the local SERS program from the local community into your tennis facility to access tennis in an affordable way. Um, so that's a little bit of advice that I might give you. And, and I think hopefully the Tennis Scotland team could advise you in that regard. Okay, thanks. I'll talk to Tennis Scotland. I'm always harassing them. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear, Maggie. Thank you. Uh, Anne Mumford, please. Yeah, keeping this uh, event going. So Anne Mumford from uh, Rosie Tennis Club in Leicestershire. I wanted to come back about park tennis, which I nearly mentioned earlier on, actually, when I mentioned IT. Before I came on this call, I replied to a very angry local resident which who'd written an email to our parish council from whom we um, lease our courts. And they were saying, why can't they access? They don't have much money. Why can't they access our courts for free? They can go to the park in Loughborough, which is relatively near. We know there are going to be a couple of new park investments close to our relatively close to where we are based. And of course, the answer is that we have to pay our rent, we have to pay our insurance, and very critically, we have to, according to the LTA guidance, well, we want to, put £10,800 a year into a sinking fund, which we have to get through income from members. So although we do have pay and play and we do have a variety of family memberships and other memberships, that basically is the bottom line. And I kind of feel that is there that investment going to go in at that kind of level into the park courts to make sure that in 10 years time they've not gone into disrepair, where many of the, which is the situation that many of them were in before the LTA have started this investment. And it I think there is a tension there, and I think we shouldn't hide from it. And, and it is about us have being rightly expected by the LTA to have a good business model. And as a result of it, we can't actually do some of these things that they can in the parks because of the investments uh, made by the LTA. When in a club, it's much harder for us to access investments into kind of like the maintenance of courts, which is not an insignificant cost. I mean, we've got six floodlight and macadam courts and the 10,800 is the guidance as to what we should be putting away. It's a massive part of our money. We can't afford to have people using the courts for free. Look, look you make a very good point, Anne. And of course, um, it won't surprise you, hopefully, to hear me say that um, you know, it's absolutely the right thing to be doing, whether you're a club or a park or any tennis facility, any sport facility, to ensure that you're operating in a um, commercially savvy way. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily always having to charge the maximum amount for the offer and services you provide, but it's about being sensible about 
your business model about ensuring that you have you know good financial health so that you can sustain your service your courts your offer for the for the future so although i referenced you know a weekly free tennis session that is happening in parks another part of the contractual commitment of local authorities is that they must um they must um ensure or underwrite um the ongoing maintenance of that park site. And to do so, we do advise them to put in place a charging model um, so that they can create a sinking fund like the same advice that we give to tennis clubs. Because from a park perspective, we're not going to get another 22 million pounds from Treasury, from the government, in you know six, eight, ten years' time when these courts need refurbishing again. So it is incumbent upon our investment, upon the approach that we're taking to ensure that it's sustainable. For the long term and therefore we are requiring local authorities to contractually commit to sustaining those courts for the long term and in many cases they do put in you know a low cost charging model to ensure that they can deliver against that commitment some local authorities have a free policy as a as a matter of course because of the um a party that's that, that, that's in power locally um and it, even if that's the case, we still require them to commit to ensuring that they will maintain the courts when they need to be maintained. So, you know, we, we are applying the same, I suppose, financial rigour um, to the parks investment as we advise clubs to do. So you can be reassured of that. OK, thank you. I shall try to be reassured. OK, thank you very much. I think we're up with the question. So, Ollie, we're just going to try before we finish things tonight. I've asked the everybody who's online with us still, what impact, having listened to the plan, listened to the conversations, if anyone's willing to let us know what impact it may have upon them as volunteers or their clubs. Is anyone willing to just sort of uh, tell us? Yeah, any thoughts? yeah anyway? I'll, 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 I'll say something, Sam. I think, Ollie, uh, I've never heard you speak before. Your reputation goes before you. I was in charge of clubs right across Kent and people always spoke very highly of you. I can see why that is now. Thank you very much for what you've put and where you've presented the strategy tonight. But one of your key things, uh, and I think this is the heart of success going forward, we've talked about parks, but you talked about being part of the community. And it's quite fascinating, this, and I would love to come back in three years' time and to look to see where we've gone here. Because... I've looked at different models across the world. Uh, I've had somebody embedded in Australia looking at what happens there, and they have a business model there. There's no doubt about it. And it produces a different type of club. It is connected with the community, but it's business orientated. Volunteers don't feature. I've looked at the Eastern European countries through the coaches which have come to work for us. And I was fascinated there how the, the villages, all the villages there have an indoor centre because tennis is the heart of their community, uh, partly brought about by climate, brought about by economic cir uh, circumstances to break out of the world that they're in in these villages. And the village pays for the facility, actually puts it there. They have to have an indoor facility. You can't play tennis in the wintertime. And then we have our facilities, which are, and we've got to remember, 60% of our clubs across the country are run by volunteers. Volunteers, not, not paid, not a business model. Yes, we have to be businesses. We have to be shrewd going forward. But I'll finish with this point to you, Ollie. Uh, and Simon very kindly put on uh, a, a session where we how were able to give questions to uh, uh, Scott. Um, and in his first five minutes of his presentation, he used the word business five times. That's a worry for me. And I'll stop there, Ollie. Thank you very much. OK, anybody else want to jump in? This is your chance uh, to give any thoughts. Doesn't matter if nobody wants to. It's fine. It's a lot to, lot to take in tonight. And Ollie's answered a lot of questions already. OK, so... Thank you very much, Ollie, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Annie, for helping me organize the evening as well tonight. And thank you to all of you. You know where I am if you have any questions. Uh, hopefully you can carry on enjoying the tennis volunteer community. We'll put everything uh, out on a video for you as well. So you'll be able to share it with others. 
and those people who couldn't make it will be able to watch it as well. And please come along to our future sessions. The volunteer community is only as strong as all of you participating and basically helping each other, because that is what it's all about. You're the experts, you know how your clubs run, and you can share it with those people who maybe need some new ideas or have just come into volunteering in their tennis clubs. So please carry on sort of going onto the site or, and coming to our events. And I'm gonna stop the recording now.